Matthew chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 13. When Jesus heard about John, his cousin, who was murdered by the king of the region, Herod, when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a secluded place by himself. When the people heard of this, they did what? They followed him on foot from the cities. Jesus, mourning the death of his cousin and ministry partner and friend, goes to a secluded place by himself. But people hear that he's nearby and they follow him on foot from the cities. Verse, verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw a large crowd and felt what? He felt compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and the hour is already late. So send the crowds away, that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus had been teaching and ministering all day. And at this point, they realized that the uh, crowds were hungry and in need. And maybe the disciples thought, maybe we should shut things down so that people can go home for the night. It was a desolate place. Remember, Jesus went on his own to pray and the crowds followed him. He had not planned on this meeting in some, you know, very fertile area. It's a desolate place. So the disciples say, let them go to the villages and buy food for themselves. And verse 16, Jesus said to them, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. This is what mothers say to, their, uh, to the husbands in the house when the children come and say, Mom, can I have something to eat? Dad said, ask you. Jesus said to his disciples, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they, his disciples said to him, we, hear, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said to them, bring them here to me. Ordering the people to sit down on the grass, he took five loaves and two fish. That was all they had. And looking up towards heaven, he blessed the food and did what to the loaves? Breaking the loaves, he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied. They picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. There were about 5,000 men who ate beside the women and children. This record is often called the feeding of the 5,000, but it was actually the feeding of even more than that, with just... Uh, five loaves of bread and two fish, Jesus feeds the multitude. What a, what a moment that must have been. I thought it was interesting that Liz said, could you please ask the congregation for some help in the kitchen with the food today, not knowing I was doing this record. And I said to her, Liz, you feed them. So that's why I was in the hospital last night. Just kidding. <laughs> what a moment here. 5,000 men and women and children fed from just five loaves and two fish. Something about the hands of Jesus. Something about the hands of Jesus and him breaking the loaves. And imagine the disciples sitting on the front lines there, seeing this happening, knowing that the people were hungry, knowing that the right thing to do was go into the cities and the villages. All they could find were five loaves and two fish. That wasn't enough for the disciples. And then something began to happen. Jesus began to break the bread in his hand and put it in baskets and break the bread in his hand and put it in the baskets. This record and records similar to this are in all the gospels. This must have been quite the moment. Jesus feeding this multitude and the disciples just in awe. I would imagine also that uh, that moment was maybe a little awkward, right? The disciples trying to be good managers and, you know, and, and logistics uh, were their thing. And they said, Lord, we need to send everybody home. He said, we don't need to send them home. You can feed them. The disciples looking at each other going, uh, Peter, maybe he didn't understand what you said. Say it again. Things on that day didn't go the way the disciples thought they would, but there was Jesus. And so the disciples and the crowds, they brought what they had to him, and something wonderful happened in the hands of Jesus. Verse 22, 
the first word in that verse is immediately. Say immediately. 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 Oftentimes in the Gospels, there will be words like immediately, which the writer of the Gospels, in this case Matthew, used to show that the two sections are connected. Okay? So think about this. He's just fed the 5,000 plus, and then the next phrase is immediately, which means right after that happened, this happened. And sometimes that's very intentional from the gospel writers to tie these two events together. And this morning we're going to sort of ask, why are the two events we're going to read this morning tied together? The feeding of the 5,000 and then this next record, which Matthew records in verse 22, immediately... Right, immediately after the feeding of the 5,000, it says that he, Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat. Notice that. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of them to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he sent the crowds away. After he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there at long last, what? Alone. Remember, the day started with him wanting to go be alone after the death of his cousin John, but he spent the whole day ministering. Then he feeds the thousands, and now at last he makes his disciples get in the boat to go to the other side of the sea, and at last he is there alone. Verse 24. But the boat, the boat carrying his disciples, was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. The wind was going against them. It was not helpful to their traveling and to their course. You know, I've heard it said that rain isn't the problem when you're on a ship. It's the wind. All right? It can rain and come straight down. No big deal. But the wind is another story. And here we see that they're being battered by the waves. And the wind was contrary. It was, uh, it was very, very much against them and strong. And it was the fourth watch of the night. That means it was somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. If you're ever up at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's probably not on purpose unless you work third shift. 3 o'clock is just like the worst time of all the 24 hours. Right? Some of you might be like, well, I'm more of a, uh, you know, 7 a.m. Is, is the worst. Well, let me tell you, 3 a.m. is the worst. If you wake up and look at your clock and it's 3, you are far away from, you know, the end of the night and you're not all the way past where it was supposed to start. You're just stuck there in the middle and it is pitch black, dark, and these boys are in a boat on a sea far from land with no moon or stars to give them light, only the occasional clap of thunder and the flash of lightning. It's three o'clock in the morning in the middle of an ocean or in the middle of a sea, pitch black, dark. Oh my gosh. Some of you are having a tight chest right now just with me describing this. The middle of the night, The wind is contrary, verse 25. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they said, at last, Lord, we read this in the Bible story as little kids growing up. We knew it was you. How nice of you to wear the blue sash today as you walk along the water. Is that what it says in your Bible? No, no, it actually says, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. Not the Holy Ghost, a ghost. And then these brave fishermen and tax collectors and zealots cried out in fear. (laughs) This is wonderful. These men, the disciples of Jesus, you know, they want to try to have it all together, but here they are. The lightning flashes and they see a figure on the water and they all go, ah! <laughs> That's what it means to cry out in fear. I know some of you when something bad, you're like, Ugh. No, no, not this day. These fishermen, these burly men of Galilee, ah! <laughs> Don't even think about falling asleep during this sermon today. 
They cried out in fear. They think it's a ghost. They have no expectation that it's Jesus. They think it's a ghost. What is that all about? They cry out in fear, but immediately, matching their cries of fear, immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Wow. What's going through their minds in this moment? What a day it has been. He's just fed 5,000 and now there's this storm and he's there, not in another boat, walking on the waves blown about by this contrary wind. And he says, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. That's unbelievable. That's awesome. What a, what a moment. What a, what a thought to say, if it's you, ask me to come out. And Jesus said, come on. The water is great out here. And Peter gets out of the boat. Think about this. He steps over the side of the boat. And that first step is solid on the waves. And he walks towards Jesus. Now, I know in a minute we're going to hear that he sings and takes his eyes off Jesus. But just for a moment, think about the moment. G Peter walked on the water. Okay? Peter walked on the waves with Jesus. Jesus said, come. Peter walks on the waves. Unbelievable. Verse 30. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. You see, all of the elements were getting into Peter's mind. You can't actually see wind, but it was as if he saw it. He, he hears it. He's experiencing the splashes, the flashes of lightning. The storm has not ended. It wasn't get out of the boat and now it's calm. It wasn't get out of the boat, you're actually in shallow water. The storm is still going on, but Jesus says, come. Peter walks towards him, but then the circumstances and the surroundings get his attention and the whooshing of the waves and the roar of the tides are louder than Jesus' invitation to come. Those things become bigger in his vision than Jesus saying, come. And so Jesus or uh, Peter rather begins to sink and cries out, Lord, save me immediately. There's that word again. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And then when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, you are certainly God's son. Think about that for a moment. Peter begins to sink. Jesus stretches out his hand, grabs his hand, pulls him up. Where are they? They're in the water. So guess what Peter does again? He walks back with Jesus, this time towards the boat. You ever think about that? Have Peter get back in the boat. He's walked away. He's, he's walked towards Jesus. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs his hand, pulls him up. And then maybe there's this moment where Jesus and Peter together walk on the water some more and then get into the boat. And as soon as they get into the boat, the storm stops. Wow. Amazing. No, no doubt you can understand why the section ends with verse 33. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Man, what, a, what, an, amazing, what an amazing day. I mean, this is like two of the coolest miracles in the Gospels happen on the same day. What was it like spending time with Jesus? I mean, this is like literally like the best day and the worst day, and it's all one day. Like, that's rare that that happens, right? It's like, oh, we got married and divorced today. That usually doesn't happen. That was like a weird example. Forgive me. <laughs> that was actually a terrible example. Okay, that's not what's happening here. Back to Jesus. Someone yell and get my attention. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the second record, the storm on the sea, similarly to the story of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Things did not go the way the disciples thought they would, but there was Jesus. 
And in this case, rather than them bringing to him what they had, he brought himself to them. So I wonder why these two records are tied together. This wonderful thing of the feeding of the 5,000s and then this uh, more uh, turbulent, curious thing of the storm and the ship and the walking on the water. I want to I wanna take away three things uh, from this record with you today. The first one is this. What makes these stories special is Jesus. What makes these stories unique is Jesus, okay? For better or for worse, Jesus is there. Let's say that together. For better or for worse, Jesus is there. If the story ended with the feeding of the 5,000, for many people, that would have been the best day of their life. And for the disciples in that boat, had Jesus not shown up, that potentially could have been the worst day of their life. But whether it was the best or the worst, there was Jesus. It was a good day for some, it was a bad day for others, but Jesus was there, so there was something about that day. It was the greatest blessing or the greatest trial, but these two stories have a common thing, Jesus is there. For better or for worse in our lives, Jesus is there. Jesus is there, we learn from this record, in small things. Hey, we're hungry. And he's also there in the big things. Hey, we're about to die. But Jesus was there. And the blessing and the miracle of the feeding should have helped the disciples in that trial and in that uncertainty, but it didn't. But Jesus was there. And so in the middle of the feeding, Jesus says, bring what you have to me. In the middle of the storm, Jesus comes to them. And what I take away from that is for better or for worse, Jesus is there. And for the disciple of Jesus, there is not any area of our lives where Jesus should not be Lord. This record tells us that Jesus cares about people when they're hungry. And this record tells us that Jesus cares about people when they're dying. I mean, if that couldn't be the two ends of the spectrum of life, a day where you forgot to pack a lunch and the day that you think is your last. But yet Jesus is there. And Jesus cares about these small things for the people that we don't even know their names. And he cares about the, the life of his 12 friends in the boat. There isn't any area of our lives that Jesus does not care about, nor that he shouldn't be Lord. He cares about their physical needs. He cares about their physical life. He cares about their eternal life. I mean, I, that may seem like a, a simple thing to take away, but I, I want to uh, encourage us to think about, are there areas of our life where we don't think that having Jesus our Lord are applicable? The big things for sure. Oh my gosh, let's fast and pray in Jesus' name. What about the small things? What about what you're choosing to do for a career? What about uh, trouble you're having with your neighbor? What about this thing that seems insignificant in the realm of eternity that you're anxious about? I think some of us are really good in the big moments going to God through Jesus. And a lot of times the people that know to go to him in the big moments, we think that the small things aren't that important. There's probably more important things for him to be dealing with. Really, the small thing here? And then there are others that like, oh my gosh, it's like, which cantaloupe should I buy? Let me pray about it. Where should I park? Not, he's going to get me a parking spot, but where should I park? This is important. Some of you are like that. Some of you are like small little things. Oh my gosh. It's like Jesus is Lord over this. What, you know, what volume should I turn the praise music on? The answer is either seven, 12, or 40. Like those are the biblical numbers. Just pick one of those. <laughs> Some of us, these small things, we think, man, Jesus cares about these things. But then we have a hard time in the big things. Right, like the little, the little small things, yeah, but the big things, I don't know, like really me? 
Really? Like, do, do I deserve this? It, it, isn't there something, you know, really? Well, this record says that for better or for worse, big or small, Jesus is there and cares about those things. There isn't any area of our lives where Jesus can't be or shouldn't be Lord. The second thing is, if you are following Jesus, Jesus is there. If you are following Jesus, Jesus is there. Cam, can you help me? Everybody say hi to Cam. Camden. Will you stand up, please? This is a disciple of Jesus, and I'm going to be Jesus just because he doesn't know what he's supposed to. Whatever. <laughs> what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? You follow Jesus. Cam, come with me. What is Cam doing? He's following me. He's following me, right? This is the Christian life. Jesus says, you know, sit here for a minute. What is Cam going to do? I thought you were going to sit on my lap. I'm really happy you didn't do that. <laughs> Man, let's get up here. All right. Jesus gets up. What is, is he still following me? Yeah. All right, right this way. Okay. Sometimes it seems like maybe he's going a little too fast. Cam, is he still following me? Yeah. Of course he is now. Right here, sometimes like this. Okay. Oh, why are you backing up? Don't turn around. This is, I have decided. Come on. All right. Now, here's, here's, here's something. We all get this part. We all get the part of, of Cam following Jesus. We all get that. But if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there too. All right? A lot of times we think that following Jesus is, Jesus is like, you know, he's, he's in heaven or he's doing something, and we as the disciple just like wander around, right? But Jesus says to his disciples, follow me. And so that means when you're following Jesus, guess who's there? Jesus. Have a seat. You did great. Look at this. is just... <laughs> Do you understand what I mean by this? If you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. I might have been going faster, slower, sitting down, moving, but he was following me and I was there. The fact that he was following me meant that I was leading him. I was showing him where to go. It, it's not just this like clever catchphrase, right? Or the disciples, Jesus said, come follow me. And then he like went like, he hid and they just had to figure it out. They followed him. And while they followed him, he was there. The places that Jesus brought his disciples to, he also cared for them in those places. Okay? The places that Jesus brought his disciples to, he also cared for them in those places. The places that Jesus brings his followers to, he's also with them there in those places. The reason why the people are in a desolate place is because of Jesus. And so you know what he did? He fed them. Why are they there? Because they heard he was there and he chose to stay there and minister to them and heal them. And so he fed them. The reason why the disciples are in the boat is because Jesus made them get in. Verse 22 said, immediately, Jesus made them get into the boat. The reason the disciples are in the boat is because Jesus made them get in, so he rescues them there. If you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. The reason why Peter is on the waves, he asked. But the reason he's on the waves is because Jesus said, come. So he's with him on the waves and he pulls him back up. Because if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. If you are following Jesus, Jesus is there. Now, we focus on the, the, the momentary thing, the, the thing that's happening. We're in the desolate place. We're hungry. Jeez, what's going on here? We focus on the fact that we're in the boat and there's a storm. Jeez, what's going on here? We focus on the fact that we're sinking in the storm. Jeez, what's going on here? And I don't want you to focus on that. It's easy to focus on that. It's easy to focus on your circumstances. What I want you to focus on is if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. 
The reason why they were in that wilderness is because Jesus was there teaching them and healing them, and Jesus took care of them. The reason why they're on a boat in the storm is because Jesus made them get in the boat. Do you think he knew there was going to be a storm? I'm sorry, but he got in the boat, and what happened? It stopped instantly. It stopped instantly. That tells me he said get in the boat for a reason. He didn't get to them before the storm for a reason. He arrived at just the right time in the middle of the storm for a reason, spoke to them for a reason, called Peter for a reason, let him walk for a reason, pulled him up for a reason, walked him back for a reason, got in the boat and the storm stopped for a reason. The takeaway from that isn't, wow, Peter walked on water. The takeaway is, that's the son of God. If you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. You having a great day? You doing, you doing what the Lord wants? You're, you're enjoying his word. You're experiencing the miracles. Guess what? Jesus is there. You're having a difficult day, difficult season. The storms of life are raging around you. But you're following Jesus. He's there. You might be in a different part of the story. You might be in the ah part of the story. Or you might be in the can I come out there part. So if you're following Jesus, but you feel like you're alone, look again. You following Jesus and you feel like you're alone, listen again. Because if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. So, for better or for worse, Jesus is there. If you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. And, and it all comes together uh, to, to conclude for us what Jesus said about the bread is really what he's saying to us today. Bring what you have to me. Bring what you have to me. Bring what you have to me. All we got is five loaves and two fish. Bring what you have to me. Bring what you have to me. I uh, had this sermon uh, written this morning. Uh, Pam stopped in uh, before we were together, uh, before uh, service started, and we were talking about things and about you know, her making the announcement for prayer for the things of this week. And uh, the way she described what she said about, you know, about God's hands, right? I have written here, uh, in light of this record, there is miracle working power in the hands of Jesus. Amen. There are two times in this story where Jesus has broken things in his hands. The first is the bread. The second is Peter. But there's miracle working power in the hands of Jesus, so bring what you have to him. In his hands, this record tells us, something special happens. In his hands, something miraculous happens. Whether it's breaking bread, breaking fish, breaking bread, breaking fish, passing it out, handing it around, bringing it back and there's leftovers, or pulling his disciple up when he starts to sink and when he starts to doubt, picking him back up by that hand, the same power in that hand, and putting him back upright on the waves to walk back to the boat together. There's miracle working power in the hand of Jesus, so bring what you have to me, he says. Bring what you have to me. Bring the broken fragments, not of bread, but of your heart. Bring the broken fragments of your fears and anxieties, your depression, your sorrows, your questions, your worries, your uncertainties. Bring the broken pieces of, of, of your tomorrow, of your today, of your relationships, of your, of your family, of your marriage, of your hopes and fears for the future. Bring what you have to me, he says. 
Bring what you have to me, your, your sin, your questions, your doubts, your unknowns. Bring what you have to me. No matter how broken and frail it might seem, there is miracle working power in the hands of Jesus, not just in the Bible story, but today. Today. Because for better or worse, Jesus is there. And if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. So bring what you have to him. Bring what you have to him. So I'd like to pray about this now. We can move beyond clever sermon points to make this real for us. Close your eyes. You can put your Bible down. Think about being in the crowds. Think about being hungry, but think about being there because Jesus was there and you wanted to hear him, you wanted to see him. Maybe you had a friend that got healed or delivered that day and you came and, and suddenly they're passing around bread and fish. Where'd this come from? And you realize that the whole multitude the men, the women, and children, they're all eating. They all have enough. They all have, it's not, hey, save some. They all have everything that they need, and you ask why. Where did this all come from? And the answer is from the hands of Jesus. Think about the excitement and the, the wonder and the joy that you had as, as one of the 12 disciples getting into the boat. Jesus said, hey, boys, meet me on the other side. You get into the boat. You, you're filled with wonder and awe and excitement. And then storms start. And it gets darker and the wind gets stronger and the moon and the stars you can't see anymore and fear starts to rise in your soul. And it's, it's been a while. And the other people around you, you've, you've transitioned from excitement and joy and wonder to fear and terror because you do not know how this is going to end. I know I would have liked to hope to believe that something great was going to happen because something great just did happen on the, on the shore, but it's not where my mind is. And then all of a sudden Peter yells out, Lord, if that's you, call me out. Lord, Jesus is here? How'd he get here? Did he, did he take a boat? How is he here? What, what's, what's going on? I'm, I'm confused. I don't understand it. But there he is. Because if you're following Jesus, Jesus is there. Even if it's stormy, even if it's uncertain, even if it's difficult, even if it's scary, Jesus is there. And now he uses his hands to grab Peter up when he starts to doubt and grab Peter up when he starts to be afraid. He, he, he grabs Peter up with those same miracle working hands that broke the bread and the fish and fed thousands. He's now using those same hands in a miraculous and healing way to pull up one of his followers. To pull him up from the place that fear and anxiety and worry brought him to starting to sink pulling back on top of the waves. And then you see him walk back into the boat, lift his leg, and as soon as Jesus sits down, the storm ends because he's the master of the seas. He's God's son. And when he's there and his hands are there, no matter the twists and turns, it's going to be all right. So all those of you hearing my voice right now, bring what you have to him. Stretch your hands out and, and, and hand to him what, what you're carrying. Hand to him that, that person you're worried about, that, that thing you're worried about, that uh, anxiety that you feel, that heaviness, that blahness that you're feeling. Bring what you have. If that's all you got, bring it. He can do something with it.
Lord Jesus, the promise of Scripture says that you are with us always. And where two or more are gathered in your name, you're there in the midst. So thank you for being with us today, Lord. It is about you today. Scripture tells us that when we're tempted, when we're in need, we can come to you and you will help. That you know what it's like to live this life, to be tempted, to face all the things, but yet to always stay faithful and trust your God. So we are bringing you our hearts right now. We are bringing you our lives, our futures, and everything in between. We're bringing what we have. Thank you for being there for us today. We love you, and we thank you that, Jesus, you love us.